So the first thing I wanted to do here is just get specific with the Achilles tendon. It's the largest and strongest tendon in the body, which should be very encouraging when you're having your conversations with patients because they are going to, the first thing out of their mouth is, I'm concerned this thing is going to rupture. The soleus fibers put a lot of force with running six to eight times body weight, gastroc two to three. This is where your heavy, and heavy loads come in. When the tendons twist on each other, there's a rotation to them, two thirds of the tendon fibers being the soleus. That's why it's very important to train the soleus. Now there's studies, and there's a bunch of them, that have come out and said, you can do standing single leg and that will give you as much hypertrophy in the gastroc as it does the soleus. So you, can, you don't have to go into 60 degrees of knee flexion. And this is what I would argue with a lot of these studies. They were not taking the ankle into a range of dorsiflexion that lengthened the soleus the most. You with me? So I would be curious if I actually gained more dorsiflexion, like off of a seated calf raise, right, where I'm lengthening the soleus more, then what did that look like? So I'm still in the camp of we train calf variability. I want standing. I want seated. I want all different variables when we're looking at this because the soleus is a big boy. The rotation, just like post-tib, allows for that springing action to occur. And again, the weakest part of the Achilles tendon being that watershed area. These diagnostic tests, sensitivity versus specificity. Morning stiffness is a big one. These tests here, so the London Hospital test, by the way, is if you were to, your patient's on the table, and you squeeze their tendon and it hurts and then they dorsiflex their foot and the pain goes away okay indicative of tendinopathy the arc test you find where it's kind of swell where it's swollen okay and you can pinch it this is also going to be sensitive and you move the foot point and flex and you feel that swelling move indicative of tendinopathies Single leg calf raise, hop tests, do these produce symptoms? So from a diagnosis perspective, we should be able to hone in pretty clearly and ultrasound is gonna be your reference. MRI is poor when we're looking at tendon health and tendinopathies. Because you can have a, a person who's moving pretty well and that tendon still might not look good. So you have to be careful because then they get in their heads about it. So for assessment, we've been looking at single leg calf raises. We have a bunch of these charts everywhere. Here's your decade. This is what you should be able to do. Okay, but on average, we want to see about 25 to 30 single leg calf raises. And Dr. Malieris would tell you that we're not progressing until we gain height. Also looking at inversion and eversion. 30 seconds, heavy band. You have to have this global strength. And I had a patient that we were working with that had a lot of Achilles issues, and it wasn't until we started focusing on inversion and eversion strength that we started to see a decrease in her symptoms. I had her on a treadmill. She was walking sideways up the treadmill on her left foot, and we were really getting some eversion action, and that was a cool little drill that we did that helped her. But important to not forget about assessing for inversion and eversion. So keep it simple. Can you do 25 single leg calf raises? Are they pretty? Can you hold a heavy band into inversion for 30 seconds? Can you hold a heavy band into eversion for 30 seconds? And if not, figure out where you need to go. And again, more charts just giving you reference. I will often take this slide also and email it to my patients. I'll be like, I'm not sending you this for any other reason than opportunity. This is what we have to gain. So when we're looking at the categories of Achilles tendinopathy, there are three things that we want to talk about.
a peritonitis, an insertional tendinopathy, and a non-insertional tendinopathy, so mid-portion, because these are treated differently. With the peritonin, it is not a synovial sheath. It is a loose connective tissue that sits around the Achilles tendon. It facilitates glide. So what can happen here is that peritonin can get irritated. And when it gets irritated, it can get very sensitive and painful. And you can see a little ball of swelling on the tendon. It will literally look like a little pocket of swelling. A peritonitis can go in conjunction with a mid-tendon tendinopathy, but you got to really pay attention with decreasing some of the symptom here because they can be very painful. Peritonitis, one way to differentiate this is it's worse with slower movements. So the slow up and down, up and down can often make this worse because you're gliding, right? Versus energy storage release. So if I was single leg hopping, you see how when I go up and down, I have more motion going through the tendon versus hopping, I don't. Which is kind of weird for people with Achilles pain because they're like, it's weird. I can't do calf raises, but I can hop without pain. That should tell you, hey, this is a peritonitis. Okay, in our treatment for that seven days, you want to work on getting the inflammation down, a little bit of Voltaren, half Voltaren, half Arnica, wrap it in Saran Wrap so you don't get that on your sheets, for example, seven days, chill out, and then you can reevaluate where you are. Making sure that nothing, a lot of the times it's something that has been irritating the back of the ankle. So look at footwear. Look at anything rubbing at the heel. Look at mobility. Or do you have early heel rise? Are you rubbing the back of the heel on the inside of the shoe? All of those things can contribute to this. Insertional tendonitis. So this is inflammation at the attachment point of the Achilles. So here is insertional, here's non-insertional. If I had to pick which one I would rather see, I'd rather see a non-insertional. The insertional tendinopathies are tough. They just tend to be a little more picky. Most common with high arched, inflexible individuals, and especially with the Haglund's deformity. So that's that bump on the back of the heel. These are hard feet, you know? The rigidity, there, there doesn't want to be like any relaxation to the foot. So because the foot's kind of in this position, you have abnormal loads happening, and then this insertional tendinopathy. Here's the thing with an insertional tendinopathy that we need to be aware of, that the tendon will break down on the forward section of the tendon. And that's where forces are the lowest. So think about that for a second. You could say to yourself, well, if the forces are the lowest on the front aspect of the tendon, then why would it break down there? Right? I have less force. It's easier. We know tendons need what though? load. So if I don't have load going through the anterior portion of the tendon, that would kind of make sense, wouldn't it? So how do we start to load the forwardmost aspect of the tendon? We need to focus on how we're going to do that, right? How do we load the forwardmost aspect of the tendon? Do we need anything to help us? So there's a lot of research looking at heel lifts. Do heel lifts help with Achilles tendinopathies? 
And you will find studies that say yes, in fact, that they do. And I think initially, when patients have tissues that are inflamed and that hurt, help them out a little bit. I think the study that we looked at had the heel lift, and this is in our Soul Switch course, at about 18 millimeters. That's hefty. I mean, most shoes are about what? I mean, not the shoes we're all wearing, but you know, eight to 12 millimeters. You gotta add another six onto that. So that's pretty significant. But again, initially, it's the same conversation we have with orthotics. It's the same conversation we have with everything. Load modification initially helps. And what also helps these patients is also lateral heel wedges. So remember where you start to see this insertional Achilles tendinopathy. It's often found in patients that have that rigid cavus foot, right? So like this. So we want to be working on what with these guys? Calcaneal eversion, pronation. But we might need a little bit of help. And that's where that lateral heel wedge, remember that orthotic for the sesamoid? How it had that valgus wedge? Similar. Because it'll help feed that calcaneus into a little bit of eversion. Um, Jen, do you have a varus post somewhere? I sure do. I think the other thing to keep in mind here is... Forefoot and rear foot or just forefoot? Uh, just rear foot. Just rear foot? Yeah. Okay. So these are posts. This is the, another sticker, right? Human locomotion. This would be a varus post. So it's thicker. If here's the factory insert, this would go on the inside. A valgus post goes the other way and or a lateral heel wedge, right? So I will take these and I'll just put it on the other side of the heel. So this is now on the lateral aspect of the heel it's thicker on the outside of the heel, so it's going to wedge me towards midline. So again, all these little things can be very helpful. When things feel tight, and your Achilles and calf are going to feel tight here, when you get up in the morning, you're like, oh my gosh, I cannot dorsiflex. So your initial reaction is going to be what? I better stretch the heck out of this thing. I better take my heel and drop it off the back of a stair. I would be very cautious about doing this with an insertional tendinopathy. Okay, that bursitis might also be inflamed and all that compression in tugging is a little much. So even when I know ankle dorsiflexion is a factor with these cases, I tend to want to go with more heavy loaded isometrics up front just so I can decrease some of that cortical inhibition, maybe work inversion and eversion heavy load, and then we can kind of see where we are. But for most people, I feel like you can get the results you're looking for without going off the back of a stair. <laughs>